Why is the storytelling of Dark Souls and Bloodborne so effective? Is it the setting, or is it the characters? Perhaps it's the references to kingdoms and groups that have long since rotted and faded away. Is it because the majority of bosses have such tragic tales to tell? Then again, it could be what we do not know that causes us to give ourselves over to these story worlds, the vague and the implied that keep us deliberating for hours on end, with such passion that a bystander would swear that the events described had actually taken place. I believe it is because of the aforementioned reasons and more why the games of From Software have such enchanting and alluring plots. I'll also be comparing the RPG elements of the Souls games to some recently released games by developers that I believe have lost their understanding of what an RPG really is. Let's have a look at both games in terms of how they begin and how that compares to other role-playing games. In Dark Souls, you begin as just another undead, waiting for the end of the world. You're not special, and the game begins as it means to continue on. You will be treated just like any other adventurer. Even though Oscar somewhat bestows the prophecy of the Chosen Undead to you, it's never really yours to begin with. In a way, you loot it from Oscar just like you would any other item. The terms of it are vague, and some would say that you're not really supposed to dwell on it too deeply at this point in the game, especially on your first playthrough. In Bloodborne, you begin under similar circumstances. Like in Dark Souls, you have no past and no name. All you know is that you have been given a blood transfusion in the city of Yharnam, a land that has become infested with beasts and monsters, turned mad by the blood. All you are told to do is seek pale blood, and Gehrman tells you not to think too hard about everything, and instead to go and kill some beasts. Like in Dark Souls, your purpose is not the key to some great conundrum. Eventually, your actions become important in the events of the world, but there are not many from the start who hail your arrival as some deific manifestation. Frampton and Karth are perhaps the closest that Dark Souls gets to treating you like some kind of messiah, but in all honesty, you remain a pawn in their agenda, a soldier fighting for their goals. It's a real pity that many AAA developers have lost sight of what is required to create a good formula for an RPG. A character's weaknesses should be just as essential to understanding them as their strengths. An example of a developer who I feel is moving in the completely wrong direction on this is Bethesda. Allow me to front load this with some things I like about Bethesda. They keep some of my favourite IPs alive and are able to create some worlds that are interesting to explore and interact with. That's all I've got for that. What infuriates me about Bethesda nowadays is that they are terrified of forcing the player to commit to their decisions in an RPG fashion. This is most clearly explicated in Fallout 4, Bethesda's enormous release that came out around a year ago. While I can't exactly say that I didn't get my money's worth, I must say, by the end of the game, I had felt so empty and had absolutely no drive to continue playing. I had plenty more locations to explore and quests to finish, but I just didn't want to. The reason for this was because the game never made me commit to one playstyle. Before the release of Fallout 4, I had planned out all the different runs I was going to do. A sniper only run, a gunslinger run, a diplomat run, and so on. The problem is that from the start of the game, Bethesda wants you to be a jack of all trades. They are so worried that you will miss out on some of the experience on your first playthrough, so they give you the ability to level to infinity. I can't stress enough how much of a mistake this was. Fallout 4 was supposed to be a role-playing game, not an ubermensch simulator. By the end of the game, your character has no weaknesses at all and as a walking tank. You aren't even able to roleplay with much effectiveness from the start because every time you start a new playthrough, you're always going to be married, you're always going to be born pre-war, you're always going to have a military background or a law background if you play as a female, and you're always going to be chasing after your stupid son. These do not make the game better. Instead, they make you play within narrative boundaries. What if I want to be a raider, or a mercenary, or a traveling doctor? The sad reality is that I won't be able to play out any of these roles unless I install mods that essentially remove the main quest and the voice protagonist features. I'm getting a little bit off topic here, so let me segue back to Soulsborne and why I think it's better. In the first run of Dark Souls or Bloodborne, 
Dark Souls in particular, FromSoft forces you to make sacrifices and choices that will affect your character's future. You want to be a knight? Fine, but be ready to have fairly low faith your first time through. You want to be a sorcerer? Fine, but be prepared to avoid most close combat if you can. You want to be a damage tanking poise machine? Fine, but be ready to sacrifice some stamina along the way. On top of this, you are afforded the relative luxury of not having much of a backstory. You're an unnamed undead. You create your past, you create your motivations, and it's brilliant. You still are guided to an extent by the primordial serpents, but at least I wanted to play through the game twice to see how my actions would affect the ending. In Fallout 4, I decided to side with the Institute, which I could probably make a whole video about, which seemed like a profound decision at the time, but afterwards, to my disappointment and shock, the world had not changed much. Raiders still roamed the wastes, townships still fell under attack, and so on. My actions seemed to have a very minimal effect on everything. It was because of this that I decided that another playthrough to evaluate the endings of the other factions was not required. It just didn't make me think about anything more. At least in Fallout New Vegas, each faction's ending with contributing character conclusions create a varied and fascinating future for the Mojave Wasteland, and on many forums, image boards, and Taiwanese cartoon discussion web zones, you'll find people debating to this day what the best outcome for the Mojave is. This is solid writing and storytelling from an RPG standpoint at its core. Earlier in this video, I was discussing the messianic theme that a lot of RPGs seem to play up. Let's review how your view as a character in Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas, Skyrim, and Fallout 4 by other characters in the game. Dark Souls 1 has already been discussed. You're just another adventurer, you're not expected to succeed, and if you want something, you better be willing to prove yourself to get it. You'll eventually become a great change in the world of Laudron, but only after being manipulated by corrupted serpents, implying that your will is not really your will, after all. In Fallout 3, Bethesda does an okay job at not pampering you as the second coming of Christ, though the story has enough problems in it to make you almost completely ignore this positive. When you eventually start the Purifier, you're remembered as a lone wanderer, a proud figure, but to an extent you've earned it. I could talk a lot about what I strongly dislike about Fallout 3, but that's not what this video is about. If you want a small hint on my thoughts of the game, I think The Pit has the best storyline and RPG qualities of all the DLC in Fallout 3. Dark Souls 2 does quite a decent job at maintaining the theme of its predecessor, that you are just a hollow who can only break the undead curse by seizing the most powerful souls of the land. While Dark Souls 2 is my least favourite Souls game from a gameplay perspective, the story does do a really good job at expanding the lore and backstory of the world, and you do honestly feel like a traveller in that world. Like in the first game, it forces you to make decisions and commit to those for the majority of your playthrough. Some would argue that the changes to combat make it more punishing and therefore a better RPG experience, but that is a conversation for another day. Fallout New Vegas, which was developed by Obsidian, not Bethesda, does a brilliant job of creating a mostly traditional RPG. Most notably is the start, as you are put in a shallow grave after being shot in the head. You're a nobody. Not great in a fight, clearly not winning employee of the month at Courier HQ, but you do have quite a strong resilience to being shot. A positive of both Fallout 3 and New Vegas is the level cap system. While some would definitely see this as a detriment to the game, I see it as something good. If you only have a set amount of points to allocate to your character, each run will be different to a certain degree, and I can attempt to do the customised playthrough that I was originally planning to do for Fallout 4. FromSoft do a great job of countering this by doing a couple of things. Firstly, there is a soft level cap for skills around level 50, at which you will start to experience diminishing returns. For example, while you would have originally received like 7 attack points for every level up of strength that you received, it goes down to 1 attack point per level or sometimes 1 per 2 levels. The second element to this is the sheer number of souls that you will require for each level up after the 200 plus soul level. After this, you'll often have to farm hundreds of thousands of souls just to gain one more level, making it quite difficult to become a jack-of-all-trades in the Souls games. Next, we have Dark Souls 3. 
Dark Souls 3 behaves fairly similarly to the previous games, though metagaming of certain elements have lessened the importance of advancing certain skills, especially around the launch. This led to the rise of dexterity-based builds that are used by people that should be stoned to death. Just kidding, that was a joke. Dark Souls 3 is still superior, in my opinion, to other RPGs being released at the moment that seem to resemble Far Cry-style methods of play, aka first-person shooters with <clears throat> RPG elements, which is as grating to my ears as fucking bagpipes. I will admit that with the increasing popularization of video games in the last 30 years or so, developers have been put under a lot more pressure to compete with each other by offering experiences that can be digested by the most amount of people for the most amount of money. While you can approach that with the argument that, wow, game developers are so evil, they only care uh, about money, when rather your thought process should be that most developers like making games but understand the reality of economics and the furiously competitive situation they find themselves in, creating an atmosphere that is very difficult for new companies to forge themselves a place among the biggest in the business. An anomaly that we can see from this is when an independent developer like, uh, I don't know, Hello Games is taken under the wing of a giant like Sony, and we all know what happened there. I think it's very admirable that FromSoft have made a real effort to maintain their original design philosophies to an extent to create a balance between great games that consumers enjoy and fiscally successful decisions that will allow them to continue to make great games. FromSoft have actually been quite lucky as many risks that they have taken in the past have paid off for them, even when they weren't sure that they would work, especially with Demon's Souls, which had a initially less than positive reception from playtesters and financiers. The fact that it developed into a cult phenomenon is part of the explanation why the Souls series was able to be made. Sony seemed to have realized the profitability of the Souls series over time, and this is seen through their promotion of the series. While well, accurate data is quite difficult to come by for the sales for PS4s for the 2015 year compared to the previous years, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that they received a significant bump after the announcement slash launch of Bloodborne. I will talk more about Sony's involvement affected the RPG elements of Bloodborne shortly. Next, we have Skyrim which is what I would consider to be the beginning of the decline for the quality of RPG gameplay as developed by Bethesda. I know that some might hear that as blasphemy, but some elements of Skyrim show the beginnings of Bethesda distancing themselves from the traditional RPG format. I think that the game's major fault is to actually force you to undertake the role of the Dragonborn. I understand that this was a major selling point of the game, and I won't lie that my loins were quite moist as my 14-year-old self imagined the possibilities of a new Elder Scrolls game since I had really enjoyed Oblivion. If we are being honest, it took me years to realize that Skyrim wasn't so much of an RPG as it was an action-adventure game. That being said, Skyrim has better RPG mechanisms than Fallout 4. While I really loathe the idea of even playing Skyrim these days, I can more than understand why people enjoy the game. It's a big open world that people love to explore and get lost in, and I've got no problem with that. What I want people to understand, at the very least, is that once you begin to casualize, that's a term I want to talk about as well, by the way, a genre, you begin to change the genre itself, to a point when it's a completely new genre. While both the old original genre and the new one can usually live in harmony, they can often be seen as this one is new and good and this one is antiquated and therefore bad. This has affected the RTS genre to a degree over time, but it's good since there is such a strong community of classic RTS enthusiasts that demand variety in the genre so you can go as complex or simple as you want. I'll admit that the RPG genre does share the market with quite complex versus simple games, but to a lesser degree. I would say that a lot of these complex RPGs find themselves in isometric format, which is both a positive and a negative. I think the issue is that slowly but surely the RPG genre is becoming one with the action genre, and since action is most of the time more palatable to people than RPGs, traditional RPGs that is, action RPGs may eventually wipe traditional first person role playing games from the map. This would be quite a ways into the future, but you get my drift. Now to Bloodborne. I want to bring up two things that I touched on before, Sony and casualization. Sony approached FromSoft as early as 2012 to create a title for the 8th generation of consoles, which would eventually become an exclusive. Sony obviously respected and understood the FromSoft product well enough to know that an exclusive FromSoft game on the PS4 would drive sales. 
They may not have expected this game to be the best game in the Soulsborne series, in my opinion, nor for it to become one of the best games ever made, in my opinion, but it was a success for both Sony and From. However, it should not be ignored that Sony's focus on sales... Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. <laughs> would have had an inevitable effect on the gameplay and the role-playing mechanics. While Bloodborne can be a difficult game at times, I believe that Bloodborne is the easiest game in the Soulsborne series overall, and perhaps the only game in the series that I could comfortably finish in a single sitting. Adding on to this fact that certain elements that were previously important in Dark Souls 1 and 2 were removed gives the game a more streamlined design and therefore more likely to be enjoyed by a larger majority of players. I am referring to things like armor, weapon selection, and leveling. Armor cannot be upgraded in Bloodborne, and since the Hunter's Garb is one of the best sets in the game, you have decent protection for use for the entirety of your playthrough, almost from the start, should you wish. The weapon count is much less than the previous games, which I actually think is a good choice regardless of intent. You can now specialize with a single weapon for the entire game, and as an anecdotal example, I find that the Saw Cleaver, one of the first weapons you collect, is actually the most effective way to deal with the Orphan of Cos, arguably the toughest boss in the entire series. I mentioned casualization before, and I want to clarify what I meant by that. Casualization is essentially the act of altering an existing genre to make it easier or more palatable to the average gamer. You could debate that quite a lot of games contain challenges colloquially referred to as casual filters, or a section that is supposed to separate the casuals from the pros. One element that is arguably negative or positive about Bloodborne is the leveling system. In Dark Souls 1 and 2, there were 9 stats if you include humanity as a stat in the first game, while in Bloodborne there are 6. While it can be debated how many playstyles there are for Bloodborne, the majority of them would be strength-based and then focused around a weapon or two, while in Dark Souls, different weapons are sometimes used for different situations. I have seen Bloodborne characters with 99 in every stat, which does fly in the face of the style of play that FromSoft probably wants to promote, but I'm not even sure how many playthroughs it would require to get to those kind of stats. From a storytelling point of view, as I stated before, Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and from a Bethesda point of view, New Vegas, are all quite similar. All three protagonists began their story with virtually nothing in their past, and are free to act how they wish, and from freedom springs forth your story. This is something that has been central to Miyazaki since the beginning, and shows that he has a true grasp on what makes RPGs great. We've already discussed Fallout 4 at some length, but I'd like to say again that I think that Fallout 4 is the sharpest decline in quality from an RPG standpoint than any of the games mentioned in this video. That being said, I understand Bethesda's trepidation in reverting to more classic styles of play. There was a period of time in the mid to late 90s in which Bethesda went through repeated financial difficulties, during which they skirted bankruptcy on several occasions. Does this give them an excuse for them to pump out games that will continue to alienate their older supporters that bought games like Arena and Daggerfall? Probably not, but that's just the way it is at the moment. I sincerely hope that great traditional RPGs are able to live on in the rapidly changing world of gaming, but who knows whether developers will remain confident in their vision as they go forward. Developer executives understand that they are responsible for the future of their employees as well, so they do not take risks lightly. Considering that very, very competent developers like Pandemic and Eidos have been bought out in the last couple of years, the metaphorical sword of Damocles hangs over the head of pretty much every developer, large or small. I guess I can hope that developers will always be around to fight against the status quo of what's becoming the best and most palatable product to serve to consumers. Anyway, I know that this video is a little bit different from what I usually do, but I hope you enjoyed nonetheless. I'd like to branch out a little bit more about what the topics I talk about are, and if you enjoyed, let me know and I can open up different avenues of videos to produce. Until next time.